What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the show, and thank you for tuning in. I have Andrew Kinney, a.k.a. the Iceman289. Some of you may remember him from the glory days of snapbacks, probably six to eight years ago. He was crushing it with his YouTube channel. And then uh, something happened, and he actually deleted all of his YouTube, so there's nothing there. There's no evidence left. But I got him on the show today, and this is actually a two-part episode. First, we get into vintage, his history, and uh, lots of fun stuff. Lots of talk about true vintage in this one. And then on part two, we get into the deep, dark web full of conspiracies. So episode one, which you're going to hear right now, is Kinney on vintage. Episode two is Kinney on conspiracy. Enjoy. <music> here dude we're here finally nice. get, finally getting this done i'm stoked to have you on the show yeah um we did a live like what must have been like three weeks ago now eh yeah i think you that, were live and then i just joined in that was like the first week this whole shit went down yeah um but i've known you now god it must be like 10 years eight. probably well yeah i'd say at least eight probably because i think i think i met well i didn't i've I've actually never met you. We've actually never met in person, but yeah, totally. we've been in communication for like eight or eight or nine years, probably. That's what that's like when I came across um, you and Jesse and Landlord. Yeah, and back uh, in, the, in the good old snapback days. The snapback days. That's right. And at that time, you were AKA the Iceman. That's two, right. Yeah, two eight yeah. nine. The Ice Man 289. Some people will probably yeah. remember. You guarantee there's going to be people listening to this that will remember yeah. the Ice Man days. Um, so that's kind of where you started in this whole show, man. Like, how, yeah. did that, how did that all come about? And like, what got you on YouTube back in those days? Um, well, I just like, I, I've always been into like video and stuff like that. Uh, so like when I was younger in high school, I always wanted to make little skate videos with my friends at the skate park. So um it would, I just started like posting like little random edits that I made on windows movie maker. And then, um, and then like, uh, I had gotten like into thrifting and like started going to the thrift store and like picking up stuff. And there's actually some people that like, I wanted to shout out that like might not even watch this. Um, and you might not even know who they are, but like, they kind of got me, I would say into thrifting or interested in it. There was this guy on YouTube, and um, I think he works for Urban Outfitters now. His name is Justin Wolf. Uh, he used to do, like, snapback videos and trips to the th well, like thrift store videos and stuff like that. Um, he, You can look him up. He, he, I think he works for Urban now. He's a photographer. Um, but he, so Are uh, those he, videos still there? Like, are these... Uh, his videos might still be up. Um, and then there's another guy, and I can't remember his name. And, uh, he got me like, but this is like, yeah, 10 years ago, probably. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so yeah, I started watching their videos. And I'm like, man, this is sick. So I started going to the thrift store and snapbacks were super popular, you know? So I started picking them up and just making videos. And then, um, I was like, man, this is cool. And I, how I came across you guys was I was at the thrift and I, I found a, an Iowa Hawkeyes Fanimation jacket. And I was like, man, this is sick. So I like tried to Google it. I was like, what is this thing, you know? And uh, I found like the same jacket on your guys' website. Like this is like eight years ago or whatever. And I'm like, and I like looked at the, the price and I was like, oh my gosh, what is this jacket? Like, this is crazy. So I'm like, dad, come here, come here. Like I showed my dad and he's like, wow, that's crazy. So then like, yeah, like 
I don't even think in, Instagram wasn't around back then. Like when I got into this, Instagram wasn't around. Like um, a lot of people were using like Tumblr. Like Tumblr was a really big like fashion. Tumblr outlet. was huge, man. I kind of yeah. Tumblr was cool. Yeah, I, like when I was when I got into all this, it was like way before Instagram and like Instagram was only iPhone when it first came out. And is so, so is Tumblr even still on the internet? Is that a thing anymore? I think so. I mean, it's still out there, but I don't know if people use it really. I think, yeah. uh, I think Pinterest is like, is like the uh, girl version of Tumblr. Yeah, like, totally. Totally. Look up all your, well, like what Tumblr would have been back then. Cause Tumblr like was guys. very artistic. There was some pages oh, that yeah. only posted very like curated. I mean, it's kind of like Instagram is, but it was cool. And then you could like, you're, pictures could go viral so like it would tumble that was the name and then people yeah. would repost 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 i remember when that was all popping we would you know there was certain pictures we'd post that like all of a sudden you'd be like this has ten thousand reshares yeah <laughs> crazy yeah and then so uh instagram well i had started watching your guys's videos on youtube and um and then and then instagram came out i think via instagram is how i like connected with you and landlord and jesse and I was just like, I was like blown away. Cause I was like, man, these guys are killing it. Like they've got like, you guys were doing your snapback hauls and, you know, pulling out massive boxes of dead sock snaps. And I was just like, these guys are insane. And um, so like, yeah, I just really looked up to you guys and it was just crazy. Like the polo you guys had was insane. And that was a fun so, time. That was a yeah, fun man. time. And I, I, when I look back at that era, like you were one of the, you were one of the bigger guys on youtube at that time doing yeah the thrift hauls for yeah, sure there was, there was only there was definitely yeah there was definitely a lot of other people though um like uh professor snap uh and um uh, dp the truth uh he was out in san francisco uh there was a lot of other people were you tight um, with those guys like did you ever yeah yeah like uh i mean i don't I'm not really in communication with them much anymore. Like we will like talk once in a while here and there, but actually it was funny because, uh, EJ professor snap, he invited me to his wedding a couple of years ago, uh, out in Utah, but I couldn't go because my cousin's wedding was the same day. So oh, no way. But, yeah. But, um, That's shout wild. out to, uh, shout out to professor snap. If you're watching this, bro. Um, so back in those glory days, like, that was early YouTube. I mean, YouTube was around yeah. for a while before that, but it was like way less saturated. Like, oh yeah, how did you find it being on there back then? Like, it was probably easier to get traction and views. Oh and yeah, like that's the thing. I've thought about coming back to YouTube, and a lot of people have, a lot of people over like the last couple of years have messaged me like just randomly. They'd be like, "Hey man, like I started doing vintage because of you. Like now I'm making money doing this, and um, you know, like you really inspired me. They're like, you really should come back and." I thought about it, but like the algorithms back then were so much better. Like, and, um, it was just like, it was just better. Like, I don't know. I don't know. YouTube at that time was just a really good place to like yeah. interact with people. Did you actually make money on your channel back then? Yeah. Yeah. I did make money. Um, I was sponsored. Uh, I actually still think I have like a, I'm technically connected with them or sponsored, but I'm, my channel is non-existent anymore. I deleted it, which was unfortunate, but, um, I was sponsored by a third party called full screen. So like there was different ways you could be, uh, sponsored on YouTube. Like you could be, um, like sponsored by YouTube itself, but a lot of YouTubers actually chose third party networks because it was safer because like, if you were sponsored directly by, uh, YouTube, like if you were uh, sponsored directly by them, that, if you like put one or two things up on your channel that they didn't like, they could like take down all your monetization, but like that third party uh, company kind of protected you. So a lot of creators and stuff like that use like full screen and uh, other platforms to like, so let me sponsorship. So, but I, I got paid by YouTube, in, the, the money came in from full screen, but not from YouTube's ads. No, it, it actually came, it came in from, uh, it came in from Google. Like I got checks from Google, but I was like promoted via full screen I, I can't exactly remember how it worked huh but they might i think they might have taken a cut or something like that so, yeah yeah and was it, was, good, it was, was, just, it, was it good money like was it enough to like i mean it no 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 i mean at the time i wasn't making enough videos uh i mean i was making like decent money for what i was doing uh but it wasn't like it wasn't like i could i couldn't survive off it and i was in high school too so it wasn't like you know it wasn't like i needed a lot of money at the time 
Um, and Crazy. so I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spit some facts here. Cause like, uh, I follow those guys rally roots. They sell like all kinds of different stuff and vintage. And, uh, now they're getting big into vintage t-shirts. They're kind of like pumping it out heavy, but they always post like their, um, their revenue. And I think that they, they post like a, a daily video, which is crazy. Like almost every yeah. post a video and their videos are minimum getting like 10 K views up to like 50 K views. Yeah. I think he posted that they're making like eight grand a month or something. Yeah. Like, like with daily posting. Yeah. That's the thing. Like YouTube, a lot of people don't understand this. YouTube is very difficult. Uh, like, and I only did it for a short time and I, when I stopped making videos, I had like 22,000 or 23,000 subs. Now this was like eight or nine years ago. So like, that was a lot back then for like a niche market for the niche market that I was into. Um, but yeah, like it, it's difficult, like just content and, you know, editing and shooting and, um, finding music and all that. I mean, there's a lot that goes into it. So if you're putting out a video every day, like that's, that's like, you're grinded. (laughs) <laughs> fully grinded okay so fast forward to now like what's your involvement in in the vintage scene and like how, how so now it's you? just kind of like a now it's just kind of like a side business just like kind of a hobby for me um i you know like i've always i never really stopped thrifting uh when when i deleted my channel i never stopped thrifting but like my my tastes and vintage have like changed for sure um you know like like i'm into way older stuff than i was in the past um yeah, totally. and um that's all based on like a lot of the people that i've met uh where i live i live in uh, like minneapolis area so in minnesota up here there's a lot of really good vintage ge- dealers i just want to like give a few shout outs For sure. and uh, pay pay some respects but yeah i had uh, uh met this guy like about three or four years ago his name's nick from the bearded mermaid in saint paul and uh he, he like i mean I was into vintage, but I didn't really understand a lot of the older stuff. Like I was really only into the eighties and nineties stuff. And, you know, he really turned me on to a lot of the older stuff. And, um, he taught me a lot about like older stuff, like, you know, buckle backs, chin Work straps, wire, yeah. gussets. Yeah. St- stuff like that. That's just rad. like free, free, free knowledge. He's a really good guy. And, and was um, this like, just by going and hanging out of the shop and like, going yeah, to- yeah. 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 Like I would, I would like, I would like go down to his shop and be like, Hey man, you want like some, some pad thai like i'd go down the street pick up some pad thai for like i'd buy him food take it to him i like i would bring him donuts and coffee and we'd just talk and like he would just just talk and like he's a really nice guy and um he's got an awesome wife she's she does like women's uh like like clothing and stuff like that vintage curation for women's stuff yeah and uh they just had a beautiful baby so yeah yeah he's really helped helped me out a lot and um and then like there's a lot of other cool people up here too like you've you've interviewed ricky and uh smokestack yeah uh kurt uh but yeah those are good guys and um and then i wanted to give a few more shout outs uh shout out to uh uh gosh i'm drawing a blank okay shout out to um cole and sam at smileback vintage in st paul shout out to uh renee brandon and uh why am I drawing? Why am I? I'm just having like a, a, I'm drawing a blank now. Don't worry, but, uh, man, it's all good. You're on the field house. <laughs> field house in St. Paul. Um, shout out to the Urban Jungle guys, Tommy, Connor. Uh, yeah, everybody uh, at Urban Jungle. So there's a lot of good vintage places up here. Uh, yeah, it sounds like a lot, man. Yeah, th- this, it's it's huge. What would you describe it as, like? There's, you know, obviously kind of what's pushing forward with like the youth culture now is like the hype stuff. T-shirts are popping, you know, like the sneaker hype and vintage markets yeah. have like collided in the last few years. So it's like, yeah, is that scene is that scene where you are? Uh, I'm not so much into sneakers. Like I, I do like Jordan ones. Like, I mean, that's just kind of a hype shoe right now. Um, I mean, I've liked them for a while. Like I probably liked them for like the last couple of years. I just. I never really gotten into them. I've never really been a big sneaker guy. I'm just kind of like a Chucks and like Vans kind of guy. Yeah. Um, just kind of like classics that last forever. I mean, the Converse Chuck Taylor's been around a hundred years and it's never going out of style. But um Is there shops yeah. like that in in your in you so you're in St. Paul? I, I'm in I'm a, I'm near, closer to Minneapolis. Okay. Uh, I actually used to live downtown Minneapolis. I don't anymore. I live in a suburb south of it now, but um yeah, I mean I'm not really, uh, I'm not really into like a lot of the hype stuff. Um, like a lot of people are, I mean, 
I'd say, I'd say like I, like 95% of my closet is vintage, maybe even more. <laughs> like that's all I wear. That's um, right, man. It, like the only things that I buy new are like Converse um, and like Dickies, <laughs> like just classic Dickies, 874s or 875s. So did you um, keep anything from the old days or is it all, is it all been like a lot of it, filtered a lot out of it's, because your style changed so much? Yeah. A lot of it's been filtered out or sold off. I do have a few pieces. Um, and I, but I do have a lot, like a lot of like nineties, eighties and nineties tees. I mean, that's really what I'm into right now. That's like one of the biggest things I collect. Uh, a lot of the people up here know about that. Um, I collect like eighties and nineties Christian band tees. Yeah. Um, okay, I've bunch. got a pretty decent collection going now. I've actually thought about making a book. Um, of them kind of like the the lightning archive or like the wrapped these books where it's just like white background with the t and a little description and it's yeah. just like a maybe like a little like 100 page or 50 page back-to-back little book or something like on christian band so how many like, do you have you know, i probably got like at least 60 or 70 right now but maybe more and they're all just like they're all just bands from the from the eighties and nineties, like Christian bands. It's kind of the music I grew up on, like DC Talk, uh, Amy Grant, Petra, Carmen, Audio Adrenaline, Newsboys. They're all bands that like people that grew up in the church, like back in the eighties and nineties, would kind of know about. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot of them are really rare, and nobody's really nobody's really into them right now. I mean, some people are. Um, I'd say, like, I, I'm confident enough to say that I'm I'm pretty sure, like, I'm one of the biggest people in that market for buying them. Um, definitely, I'm not really selling them right now, but you just marketed. You're the only guy that hits me up for them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so as far as like your personal style, you're like, you're into the classics, you're into the staples, yeah. which I appreciate. You know, I'm into that more so myself too. Um, who do you look up to as far as like design? Do you, do you follow new fashion at all? And like, Oh yeah. Like, um, gosh, I'd have to just like flip through my Instagram. I, I mean, I do follow new fashion. Um, uh, I mean, some of my favorite, like newer brands would be bare knuckles, shout out Cole and Jacob. Jacob actually goes all the way back to YouTube too. Uh, Jacob Keller, uh, like I knew him a long time ago. Um, nice. and so yeah, bare knuckles is a really cool brand. They, they kind of take the vintage flavors of everything and put a modern twist on it. Um, a lot of, yeah, I mean, as far as designers go, I mean, I think a lot of people look up to Virgil Abloh. Um, yeah. you know, I mean, I do like. I like his, I like his, his style. I'm not really a big off-white guy. Um, it's just, I don't know. I've just never been into it. I, I just like vintage clothing and it's just kind of like, you know, like, so, it's, there so are some, you've learned a lot about like, like details about workwear, about like yeah. American history through clothing, right? Essentially mm-hmm. that's what you're looking at when you're talking about like workwear and cowboy yeah. culture and like denim culture and all these different things. Mm-hmm. So like, Spit a couple like details, maybe that like you've learned from, say, the Bearded Mermaid over the years that kind of like you had no idea about. Um, yeah, like I didn't know what chin straps were, like you know, nineteen twenties, thirties chin straps. Yeah. Um, I didn't know anything about that. Like, um, obviously, I like I knew about selvage like a few years back because, um, like I had gotten into like selvage denim like a few years back, um, but I was buying like newer newer brands like i wasn't buying like vintage selvage i was buying like 316 uh like denim and stuff like that there's a really good denim shop up here called uh black blue in st paul too so if you're ever in in st paul check it out but i've been there and i you know i've bought i've had a couple pairs of lbc 501s um back when back when back when they were actually producing them at cone mills uh which is unfortunate now they that cone mills closed down and um because cone mills like, is minnesota right no it's over on the east coast i think it's in connecticut or somewhere i believe did minnesota but, uh, have anyway. much of like a manufacturing back- oh yeah oh yeah like yeah minnesota like i mean there's minnesota a lot of woolen mills man yeah woolen mills there's a lot i was gonna say there's a lot of like woolen uh products that came from up here um you know like just i mean a lot of workwear and stuff like that yeah um, totally but um, yeah, I mean, so people that don't know the chin strap is like, just what, what you say, a chin strap that goes over the top button of the shirt. It's, it was like yeah. an extra detail they would put on shirts back in the twenties, thirties, well, early, maybe mm-hmm. even the turn of the century mm-hmm. to kind of adjust it. So you could make it bigger for your neck. If your neck was like, exactly. Bulging. <laughs> exactly. And it's funny. Cause like, uh, yeah, they made the work where like, 
the last like a century, you know, and it has. And, but, but that's the thing, like, like people would repair their own, like their stuff. Like now it's like, we live in such a fast culture that like you buy something and it breaks and you just buy a new one. But like back then, like, you know, you lived in a log cabin or you lived out in the country somewhere and you know, you got Sears and Roebuck catalog and you, you ordered one pair of pants a year and one shirt and you wore oh, yeah. it to church, you wore it everywhere, you wore it working. And, and if it, if it got messed up, you had to fix it and your grandma would stitch it or your mom would stitch it. But if you look yeah. into the history, you know, I've read lots about this and Levi's, how they operated. They have like, they would have like traveling salesmen go around to these outposts and yep. look at the products and show samples. And, you know, a store in, in the boonies might get a delivery of Levi's like once a year. And you had to like put your name on a list to be eligible to even get that pair. Get them. Yeah. So you, it was like a hot commodity and they weren't producing yeah. enough to supply everybody. So yep. if, yeah, like if you had them, you would repair them till the bitter end. Plus, you know, people had no money. So you just exactly alive forever. And it's like that whole theory function before fashion. Like there was no, you know, when Levi's was pumping out the early products, they weren't looking at like putting this pair of jeans on a runway. They were mm-hmm. looking at like, how is this going to last for a miner mm-hmm. in, in deep in deep in a dark pit for 12 hours a day, Absolutely. Away, you know, and they built it to last. And that's why the history is so important. And that's why the fashion never really died away because it has such a, a unique history and it, it's mm-hmm. a purpose and it like it's deeper than just like you say fast fashion something that shows up on a runway for a minute it's gone in a month you know like it's mm-hmm. yeah yeah that's the thing like i mean like that's one reason why i really don't really like fast fashion and i'm not just talking about like h&m or forever 21 i'm talking about like just fashion in general because it's so it's so in and out and like i think that I mean, it, it's a, it's an art form. Don't get, get me wrong, but like, there's so many pieces out there that have just stood the test of time. That when you just like, when you just like look at those pieces, they just they they don't need anything. They don't need any hype. They just are what they are, and they've stood the test of time. Like Converse, you know, Levi's, like just work where the, the hoodie, man. Like we're both yeah, the hoodie. hoodie. Like this was originally created for athletes to stay and athletes. warm and the military. Correct stay warm yep. when they're on a run in the middle of winter like correct a purpose for this you know like yep. the t-shirt was originally like an undershirt people didn't wear a t-shirt as nope. like a fashion statement you never would yep. wear just a t-shirt when the nope. t-shirt was invented right absolutely yeah um yes a converse like you said basketball shoe but it was like the, that like very perfect basic basketball shoe and yep um yeah, these things just last forever. They're never going to go away. You know, it's like, no, we'll wear it to the end of time. I know. And it's, it's, uh, it's really, it's funny. Cause like, you know, you've got brands like, uh, like hair on Preston or whatever, like, you know, like a couple years ago, they really did like a w- workwear thing. And, and you see it on the runways now. Like you see like these high, high end fashion brands, uh, you know, pulling from vintage stuff. I mean, it's like, it's like that when you look at polo i mean that's that's all that polo is like 80s and 90s polo jackets i mean it's just references from like 60s and 50s jackets i mean you yeah, know totally. like it's all fashion references references details from the past absolutely polo and it's and they've done a wicked job of it with like double rl and killing absolutely it like the the next level details right and yeah. that's kind of where like you know, I'm into that stuff because it's interesting being in, I mean, you too, it's being in vintage, you see these brands that do do things authentically or like put out something with a detail. And that's one of the funnest parts of being in this business and having this knowledge is being able to like identify, be like, Ooh, they took like that buckle from like that pant or they, they yeah. you know, took a lapel from like a Navy jacket from back in the day or whatever they yeah. whatever it is, but you get to identify it. And that's why so many people start in vintage because basically yeah. you're getting like the history lesson through. Absolutely. Fall. I mean, you look at any like major retail fashion brand, like they're sending people out to Rose Bowl to like scout for pieces to like, you know, I mean, to like, Oh yeah, totally. Reference, oh. you know, like it, it's all about reference pieces. And you know, if, if, if you're a dealer at Rose Bowl and you know your stuff, like you could, <laughs> you could charge a little more to those, those people that are trying to get reference pieces. I bust those, up that question com- out that you can tell, dude, when they roll through, yeah. it's usually like a group of people. They'll be like three or four kind of working together and they'll be like talking with each other about the piece. Yeah. 
I just, I'll just straight up be like, so what brand are you from? Like, yeah, I don't even exactly. like, preface it. I'm just like, so what brand? No, they're always like off put like, what? How do you know I'm with yeah. a brand? I'm like, yeah. I have, I have been, I, yeah, it's like, I've been doing this for years. I know what you look like, you know? Like, yeah, totally. Yeah. Cool, man. Um, so what else do you want to talk about? Are you still thrifting? You still selling? Oh, oh yeah. Well, I mean, thrift stores are closed right now because of the whole COVID thing. Um, sorry, what do you do besides yeah. like, what, what's your actual job? Like, where's your money? My actual from? job is, uh, I'm actually a valet. I, I just a valet on the side. Like, that's just kind of like what I do for a restaurant, um, but I do for, for what? No. Uh, well, yeah. Restaurant. Um, hotel okay I, I valet downtown i started down there um and i've been doing it for like the last couple of years it's decent money man it's just it's good easy money yeah good but tips, now right? because everything oh yeah tips um but yeah i mean so like I, it's a combination of that and vintage and um so yeah i mean i went to college oh uh, yeah so i guess backtrack out of high school i went to college and then like college kind of like got in the way and so like i i like slowed down doing youtube and then i'm like it was just like really challenging going through school and my family was going through a lot of stuff at the time and my parents got a divorce. So it was just like hard on me emotionally. So I kind of like put a pause on that. Um, but yeah, so I went to college and then I, yeah, I have a, I have a degree in uh, media communications, a bachelor's in media communications. So, but yeah, I'm just, that's what I'm doing right now. Cool, cool. Just, Sorry, can we talk about that for a sec? Was, was yeah. your parents getting a divorce and like that hard time for you when you went off YouTube or was that? Yeah, okay. it was around that same time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. It was like my freshman year of college. That's rough. Um, I think I like, yeah, I like deleted my channel like in 2015. So it was like a few years where I like just was MIA and I wasn't making videos, but my channel was still up. And then like after that, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's just, it's life, man. Life hits you and. It's true, man. You know, perfection is impossible. Everyone has their shit, you know, everyone goes yeah. through different, different stuff. Um, you were, you were, so you talked about Smokestack and Ricky briefly you gave yeah. them a shout out so you were out at their warehouse do they have the same warehouse or do they have a different no warehouse? no 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 yeah i was just well i think ricky keeps his stuff out at kurt's place i was just out at kurt's place yesterday yeah um, and is he like out in the country somewhere yeah he's way out in the sticks man nice. it's nice though he's he's got a huge space and he's a really so, cool guy he does a lot of like metal working and like uh fabrication and he sells antiques and yeah it's just like really cool he's just got like piles of clothes everywhere it's it's amazing yeah, if you, if you if you don't know, I did an episode with those guys uh, yep. talking about their their way of picking, which is barnstorming, I call it, but it's just just sc scouring <laughs> it's true, man. houses. It's yeah, totally so true. Don't listen to that episode, but that's. Have you ever gone with them on those? No, no, I haven't. I mean, they're pretty. Does they're it pretty interest like, you? Oh yeah, I would love to. You know. Yeah. Um, I would love to. I mean, that's the kind of thing, though. It's such a. It's such a. Those those pieces are very rare and i mean like i don't blame them like that's you got to keep your circle tight you know what i yeah, mean no, so, for sure for sure so um, which i was I'm, I'm almost surprised that they came on the show to talk about that because a lot of people would say i'm not talking about this and fair enough <laughs> you know i was talking to somebody yeah. else about it and there's like all this sort of controversy about what they do because they're 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 literally going into abandoned houses and they're taking mm -hmm. what's left. And, you know, there's a theory that like, well, that's property of somebody else and you're literally don't have the rights to it. And then there's a the theory, well, if I don't take it, this pair of jeans is going to rot away and we've lost a, a crucial part of American history. history. Yep. So, I mean, I'm, I, I, I definitely am on the side of like, take that pair of jeans. Don't me too. Me away. too. You know, like me too. Yeah. that person doesn't want to clean out their own house, clean it out for them. Like, but um yeah some yeah. of these people they're like take it i don't care like they don't want it you know and um yeah. i mean i'm pretty sure they asked a lot of the times before they go in yeah, yeah um but i mean that's the thing yeah it's like like really what what is the argument to not taking it i mean other than it's somebody else's property but it's like yeah i mean half the I time mean, it might not you even got be people like you got people like um uh, like brit who goes into mines like how is that any different i mean that's a true mine from like a mine from like the 1800s that might have owned that might have been owned by some big oil company or some like big land investor that's been shut down for over 100 years and brits down there you know pulling out denim like how is that any different than some and, house from like the exactly 40s, you know? that that mine would still be owned by somebody like even if it's correct long, it's definitely owned by somebody so you're right it is it's still somebody's property yeah, there's no difference, man. I say, I say, take it. I mean, if, if it, a lot of them would be owned by like 
huge conglomerate corporations now because it's just like grouped into their their land holdings, right? So they're yeah. never going to do anything with that problem. No. I mean, you can tell a lot about the value of some, like the value that somebody places on something if, if like based upon the condition it's in. So like, I mean, if, if a house has been sitting there for a hundred years and the clothes are, you know, 60, 80 years old and nobody's touched them, like that's, that's two generations worth of, of, you know, years that like nobody's been in there, like take it. I mean, like there's, you know, it's yeah. just like, that's a good it's a point. no brainer. Like the value of the value of clothing, you know, it's like, Everyone who sells vintage at some point has got the question, like, why I could just go thrift this or the comments people say, like, why are you charging 50 bucks for a shirt? I can just go thrift this. Right. And then it, you know, I had this conversation the other day and, you know, you look at those guys, it's like, well, they drive around the countryside looking for this shit. You can't thrift mm-hmm. this, you know, you can't yep. get this. Or it's like this person spent like four months digging in thrifts to find that one t-shirt. So yep. like, sure, you can go try to find it, but like, how much is four months of your time worth to you? Is it worth Correct. the bucks that you're going to spend on this garment or the hundred bucks Correct. or whatever? And Correct. It, it's kind of like the value of something is related to how rare it is, which is directly related to the amount of time that it's going to take you to find it. Absolutely. And I a hundred percent agree. And, um, you know, I've always been torn on like vintage pricing, but now more and more I'm beginning to realize like this stuff doesn't exist. And okay. Like, okay, not only are we, are we taking pieces from the 80s and 90s or the 70s and 60s, we're pulling these T-shirts, you know, out of history. And they, I mean, we're, we're selling them. Okay, the, the type of manufacturing, like for me, okay, like, you know, I don't know really what people charge for like vintage blanks. Like, let's say a Hanes Beefy 50, 50, like a, a, a single stitch salvage pocket blank. Like, okay to find a t-shirt with that quality of manufacturing now doesn't exist. Like, unless you're like in some really nice shop in LA, you know, but then even them, they're charging 60, like they're, they're even charging $60 for new tees. And so it's like, so it's like when, like, I'll, I'll tell my friends, yeah, like, okay, 20, 25 bucks for a vintage blank. And they look at me like, what? Like, are you kidding me? And I'm like, okay, then you find this t-shirt at H and M for the same quality. You find this t-shirt at the mall for the same, you find this t-shirt in a retail retail store for the same quality. You're not going to find it. You know, like it just does the quality of the manufacturing just yeah. doesn't exist anymore. And, and so I, feel I like, have, I have 20 here from you to pick from. You're going to get your size. Right. It's going to take yeah. the guesswork out of it. It's going to save you time. It's convenient. Bingo. For you, and yeah. y- you get what you want and it's <laughs> yeah, exactly. Bucks, you know? Yeah. It's yeah. It's, I wild. Know. it's funny. I like, you know, some of my friends, they like, they like vintage and they want, to buy pieces from me and then they'll i'll like tell them a price and they'll be like are you serious and it's like they're like yeah and they'll say the same thing they'll say like well i could go thrift that for the, the you know i could go find that and i'm like well then do it like then go do it yourself like totally. you, don't, you don't need me you don't need me like i'm out here thrifting i'm out here sourcing pieces like if, if you can find it yourself just go do it yourself then like <laughs> speaking of price you know, you're, I haven't, I've interviewed a couple of people from your neck of the woods, but like, how is pricing situational? Like, do you find that stores in your town will be charging big money for stuff or is it end up being cheap? Oh no, where you it's, are, it's crazy. Like, um, I was actually talking with Kurt about this the other day and I, I talk with my friends about this up here all the time, my vintage buddies, but, um, the Midwest, like if you want it, like, okay. Sh- like if you're, if you're in LA and you have a store in LA and you're listening to this for any reason, Come to the Midwest and source because people give away vintage up here for like next to nothing. Um, and like, it's funny. Cause like we'll, we'll do flea markets up here and we'll like sell a t-shirt and, and we'll like all look at each other and be like, Oh yeah, that'd be like a hundred bucks in LA, but we'll, we'll like charge like 50 bucks for it or something like that, you know? Yeah. And so I feel like up here, the pricing is very reasonable, like beyond reasonable. And that's just like in the stores, everyday vintage. You can go find it. It's way cheaper. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the it depends on the store you go to. Um, there's a lot of dealers up here, like Nick, uh, Nick from Bearded Mermaid. He is extremely reasonable. I mean, his, his motto is like is like everybody walks out of the, out of his store, uh, and there's always a little bit of meat left on the bone. Meaning, like, whatever you buy from him, you could probably always resell for a little more, and or a lot more. Motto. It's a wicked yeah. motto. And I mean, I mean, that's just kind of something he, he's told me. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's like, it, it, you know, I think that as time progresses, 
uh, prices of vintage should continue to go up because when you think about it, like, um, and this is, this is the interesting thing that like Virgil has kind of like tapped into about like vintage pieces that, you know, he, he had that quote in an article a few months back or a while back, but like the pieces that we're finding, like I said, the, that, that, that type of manufacturing does not exist anymore. And so, um, it's like, it's like you're buying a piece of history that you can't, you can't remake this anymore. I mean, you, you can, but it takes a lot more effort. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, like double RL stuff or, um, you know, like Larry, Larry's stuff like that. He, that he rep, rep re- retro, you know, um, like Heller's cafe, like, um, you know, that, that level of manufacturing just, it does not exist anymore. And so like, I feel like as time progresses, these pieces get older and they should get more expensive because it's like they're farther back in history and be more rare. Mm -hmm. They're going to be older. There's going to be less of them out there. Absolutely. Um, The interesting thing though, about that theory, I mean, for sure it's like that for classic vintage, right? Like certain things are going to go up and certain things always come up and go down depending on like the trends in, in new fashion. It kind of based on what people want, but right now it's like, there's more, 90s on the market than ever before because there's I know. so many more people looking for it. Like it's all yeah. of a sudden it's this massive boom in in thrifters and pickers. Mm-hmm. Like I remember your day, like the, the snapback days, thinking like, man, like there's a lot of like there's a lot of like pickers out there now, and then nothing compared to now. No, You're- no, yeah. So there's so yeah, and it's funny because the the market on the t-shirts, on a lot of them, still seems to be rising, even though like they're not getting any more rare. They're actually getting less rare because there's more people yeah. out there finding them like crazy. Yeah. yeah. It's funny. Cause like, yeah, like a heart shaped box tee, like a few years ago, it was like, Oh my gosh. And now it's like, honestly, who cares? Like yeah. it's, I mean, it's a cool shirt, but it's like, there's been so many of them that have found, have been found. And um, yeah, it's, it's funny. Cause like, I think when you look at fashion, like the, like as far as in modern day society, the t-shirt is like the most iconic piece of fashion. Like, you know, it's, it's the most, like a t-shirt and a pair of jeans is like, those are the two most universal, um, pieces of clothing that people wear, you know 100%. I mean? I have, I have a whole book just on the white t-shirt, like different people wear yeah. through history. Yeah. Yeah. And like we, like I said before, it, that t-shirt was invented by, I don't know who invented exactly, but you know, probably dates back to like world war one, like military athletes, people needing something to like soak up sweat. It's just an undershirt. Absolutely. Just Absolutely. a version of an undershirt to soak yeah, up. Yeah. And like, like, honestly though, like hoodies, like hoodies weren't, they weren't around at first. It was actually sweatshirts. And then, um, and then people started, uh, sewing hoods on after the fact that yeah. so they would, you know, they would, they would separate the, the seam around the collar. Uh, and then they would, you know, they would sew a hood and then they would attach it afterwards. You totally. Know? So yeah, um, it was like the crew neck came first. And then, like you said, uh, they call them over hoods because, yep. or, or after hoods, there's two names. After, for them. Yep. After hood, after hoods. Yep. And then, yeah, somebody at some point was like, fuck, I want to keep my head warm. I'm just going to like sew some more fabric on and create this hood to a crew neck. And then it became a new thing. And then I guess for like probably 10 years, they, they still kept making them like sewn on over a crew neck versus like yeah. the sewn in hoodie which yeah. is a wicked piece of history if you ever see it them is. the details look so cool man they are they're they're like they're unicorns man they're just they're diamonds in the rough but yeah, yeah i mean like when you think about it like football players they used to wear wool jerseys yeah and so that that's where it, that's where it came from it came from uh like they they wanted something that was a little more breathable and light so they wouldn't be so sweaty and itchy and um so they kind of came up with like a jersey material and uh and then that just kind of morphed into sweatshirts and yeah and then they started putting hoods on it's so insane that people used to wear so much wool like that that i know like when you look at natural fabrics it's like wool cotton uh i don't know you could make clothes out of hemp and all these they probably did make clothes out of hemp back in the day but then the government was like can't you can't use it <laughs> like there's there's only so many natural fibers and wool mm-hmm. was basically everything for like hundreds of years right absolutely absolutely People made bathing suits out of wool how uncomfortable absolutely. would that be i know absolutely i mean before Go before ahead, um before like you know levi's came out miners and workers were wearing wool pants and then and then canvas 
you know, the first pair of Levi's was canvas. It was like white twill canvas. Yeah. And, um, like and then canvas weight, like a ex- car yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. And so, um, and then, you know, denim and, and then they started adding indigo. Um, yeah. but yeah, like the miners wore wool pants. I mean, everything was wool. Your suit was wool. Um, you know, and your, that was, hat that was, was wool. why Levi's came out because they were like, there's a huge problem here. How can all our workforce be wearing these wool pants that are meant for like to go out, go out like with your suit to dinner or whatever well i guess everyone just wore suits it was like there was no there was no like, i know there was no dif- there was no differentiating casual with formal wear it was like there was just one dress and it was all kind of formal until Absolutely. they created workwear but then even then nobody would like be wearing workwear in the city it wasn't like a thing you probably did no you were unless working. you were like delivering goods or something from a farm but even then like you would probably go dressed to you know, deliver goods to a store that you, you know, you brought from your farm. Like you would, you would try and dress appropriately, you know? So think about how many pants they would go through, like working hard in a pair of like wool slacks. It's probably, but I mean, even the wool pants back then were insane, you know, like you look at a pair of like LL Bean, like script wool pants with like the suspenders, suspender things on them from like the eighties. And like, even those are insanely thick, you know, like the the script LL Beans. Yeah. Um, it's funny we're talking about cotton and wool and the transition in the jerseys and everything. We had a LL Bean overhood recently that was like a combination of wool cotton, but where like they transitioned from wool. Wow. Cotton. Super amazing piece. It was like mint condition. You could see like the wool, you could see the wool fibers in it, like differentiating. So it had like a, it was like a heather gray, but had like a such an interesting heather gray color. Wow. Um, yeah. And like, that's, that's the kind of shit that jazzes me up when you find that you're like, mm-hmm. wow, this is like a piece, like a transition piece. It's like, maybe not a lot of people have ever seen it because it was like, they didn't do this kind of like mix absolutely fabric for a long period of time or. Absolutely. Yeah. Those pieces are really cool. I'm trying to think of like other pieces that would be kind of like, like that. I mean, um, you know, obviously like, obviously buckle backs are really cool. Um, Cause before yeah. that it was, it was like, it was just like rivets for where the suspenders, suspenders would go. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, then so buckle back was that transition. Buckle back. And then they went to the belt. Loop. Well, they had buckle back with belt loops. So you could belt wear the loops, belt yep. and eventually it just went into all straight belt belts. Loops. So it's like, yeah. yeah, like how they held them up, you know, and I guess. And then I, production demand was, demand was higher for them at that point, like into the forties and, you know, fifties. And so, you know, you know, they could, they could make more of them to a specific size instead of having to make, more general sizes with just, you know, like smaller amounts of them, production amounts with just a buckle so that they would fit, you know, you exactly. know, you could buy a 30, a 31 or a 32 with belt loops so that you could buy your exact size and demand was higher and production was higher. And Yeah, totally makes sense. Um, okay. This is the part of the show. We're going to switch lanes here. I might even break this episode <laughs> into two episodes. I think I'm going to do that. We're going to have a part. We one, should do it. A part yeah, one bro. of Kenny and a part two of Kenny. We're going into part two right now. Okay. Thank you for tuning in. Please go subscribe to the channel. I really appreciate it. Our conversation continues and it gets pretty deep. So go listen to episode two if you're not afraid.